Okay, so let's return to our main text here. All right, verse 12. Let's talk about a little bit about Pergamos, and then we'll close it here. Unto the angel of the church in Pergamos, right? So John is writing to this angel, representation of the church in Pergamos. These things saith he which hath a sharp sword with two edges. So notice Jesus Christ has a sharp sword with two edges. That is, notice, a tribulation wording right here. How so? Look at Revelation chapter 19. Turn to Revelation 19. If you're fast enough, you can go to... If you're fast enough, you can go to Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4. Okay, Pergamos. Ah, I forgot to mention what Smyrna means. Smyrna meant myrrh. Myrrh. Smyrna means myrrh. And you know, myrrh is used as an embalming over dead bodies. So this was truly a persecuted church, see? Let's look at Revelation chapter 19. Notice when Jesus Christ comes down in Armageddon, he comes down with verse 11. I saw heaven open and behold a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, capitalized. See, that's Jesus. Look at verse 13. He was clothed with the vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the what? Word of God. Verse 15, out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword. See that? So that's tribulation wording. Jesus Christ is telling the church of Pergamos when he comes down, conquers the Antichrist kingdom, he has that sharp two-edged sword. But that sharp two-edged sword at verse 13 is the word of God. You might say, how do you know that's the word of God? That's found at Hebrews 4. Notice right here, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Look at that. So this is referring to Jesus Christ having a two-edged sword. So there's a tribulation wording there. Let's look back. Verse 13. I, uh, Revelation 2.13 I know thy works, so the works of Pergamos, and where thou dwellest, where they're dwelling, even where what? Satan's seat is. Okay, that's important. Where is Satan's seat? Where is Satan sitting? Right here. So there is no better place for him to sit where the Roman Catholic Church would be at. That's where his seat lies. Okay, if we look throughout our church age during this time, who was the number one enemy, number one city that you can think throughout this whole church age timeline that always resisted the Christian church? From the beginning of Ephesus even to Laodicea, it is Rome. Yes, sir. It is Rome. You think it's Hollywood? You're going to see Roman connections with that one. You think it's the banks? You'll see Roman Catholics involved. Yep. You think it's Washington, D.C.? My friend, you will see Catholics, Jesuits everywhere. Yeah. There's no doubt Rome is it if you look at all of church history anyways. It is Roman power. Babylon religion was always alive ever since Nimrod. It just shifted in different forms. Yes, in this time, it was undoubtedly Rome. So during Pergamus' timeline, it makes you wonder, hmm, then what was uh, that timeline where it was becoming more Roman, more Catholic. Ah, okay, let's keep reading here. And thou holdest fast my name. So Pergamus held fast Jesus Christ's name. Christianity was victorious. That's true. During the church age timeline, Christianity prevailed against pagan Rome. Pagan Rome uh, was losing its power. So what did they have to do? Under Constantine, they had to combine the two together. So this is a Christian church that combined with pagan Rome. And that's what you're going to find out here with Pergamos. Let's keep reading here. And hast not denied my faith. They didn't. They overcame. See, during the Smyrna timeline, they never denied Jesus. Even in those days where an Antipas was my faithful martyr who was slain among you where Satan dwelt. So notice God even named a specific martyr who died for, their na for the name of Jesus Christ where Satan dwelt. Now, if you think during the timeline, where were Christians being persecuted? It was Rome. That verse is where Antipas died, where Satan's seat dwelleth. 
So this is not, uh, so Satan's seed will very be likely roam. But I have a few things against thee. He didn't say this to Smyrna. He said this to Pergamos because Pergamos, uh, Smyrna did not compromise in mingling with Rome. Pergamos combined with pagan Rome. We'll keep reading. What are the few things God has against them? Because thou hast there them that hold the doctrine of Balaam. See, they took Balaam's doctrine with them. Balaam is a false prophet. Who taught Balak? Balak is a pagan Moabite king to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel. So they put a stumbling block where a problem among the Jews to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Notice that Balaam contributed to telling Balak that the Jews make them sacrifice to their idols and for fornicate with your people, Balak. Now, this is very interesting. If you look at your Old Testament, it doesn't show you that. It will show you that Balaam, he tried every way in the world to, make, to compromise with Balak, but God kept preventing him from cursing the Jews. So Balaam, you can imagine, he's all depressed, you know, and sad. And he's like, man, I can't get my, million, uh, my blank check from the king now because God's kept scaring the devil out of me. So then Balaam, what could he do? He could tell, instead of cursing the Jews, he can tell Balak, why don't you make them mingle with your people and worship the idols? That way I can get a little bit of a handout from you. And that's why it makes sense when you read your Bible in the, in the Old Testament. The Bible says in the Old Testament that the Jews killed not only Balak, but Balaam too. And it makes you wonder, why would God kill Balaam? Because Balaam didn't curse the Jews. Advanced revelation right there. Further revelation jumped all the way down to Revelation chapter 2, verse 14, where, do, where you don't see it at your Old Testament. And you don't believe in advanced revelation, huh? If you don't believe in advanced revelation, you're not going to see that, my friend. You're not going to see that. So notice that Balaam, he caused Balak to make the Moabites seduce and mingle with the children of Israel. That's why it makes so much sense that the book of Jude, if you read the book of Jude, the Bible says that Balaam went after money and his soul was damned in hell for eternity. What? I thought Balaam was a prophet of God. No, the Bible says he's a false prophet. He's a false prophet. That's what the Bible says. Because he went after money and he got his money. Because why? He, want, he caused Balak to make the Moabites sin with the nation of Israel so that he can get his money. He got what he he got what he wanted. He got his money, but it costed him his soul for all eternity. That's what happened. So that was Pergamus's problem. Is that what they went after the doctrine of Balaam, a false prophet, and Balak, a pagan king. During the Church Age timeline, there was a pagan Roman king, Constantine, and there was a false prophet as well, where it mingled the two together. The Roman Catholic Empire, church and state combined together. That's why today in America, we emphasize so much about separation of church and state. Why do we do that so much? Because uh, the beginning of our forefathers' history, America's beginnings, they were all against the Pope and the Catholic Church. That's, if they were thinking about a religion, it wasn't Islam or Mormonism. It wasn't even Masonry. It was the Catholic Church. They knew that was public enemy number one. That's why they did the Constitution and all that. Masons and the other guys, they had to go underground to do it. Catholic Church was so powerful, they were all over that it was public knowledge. Public knowledge. All right, we will continue Pergamus and see what happened in this mess.